So when I was watching the film, uh, I was very really interested in all of that very relationship with the So I was I want to hear more about your thoughts on this as well. Visiting all those things in terms of what it gives to you as an individual to have a picture of the picture Yeah. Well, why don't I just talk to Cassie and Mark about relationships? But also, um, so growing up on the res, like, we had a lot of people coming in and like showing my home to me. And so I was kind of like flipped upwards. And I'd be like, oh, look at the our house, look at this like, dog. Okay. And it was never what my home looked like to me. And so, when going through this entire process, so there's a lot of accountability that we held ourselves to. Um, we had like a five step process throughout it, which for pre production, production, and post production, making sure that everyone involved in the like actively full body enthusiastic consent, yes, wanted to participate. Um, and so, even while out there, like I grew up teaching film and I grew up film at um, a young age. And so, even being on set, like a kid came up and wanted to learn how to use the camera, I'd show them how to use the camera and like look around with the camera and show me their world because that's, you know, in a lot of ways, I was allowed to tell stories. I was allowed to to like, do this thing, but that doesn't mean that it's not their stories and they don't have to get to actively be a part of it. And if I wanted to see through their eyes, I think that's what film is in so many ways, is understanding somebody else. We all want to know, like, do we see the world the same? And I, I was in the rest of my life in bed watching films, and every single person in the world like made 10 minutes about their life, just so I could like, see, do we see the world the same? And that's really like how we built a lot of relationships. We also like asked for a ton of help. Um, it was like a small crew of filming, but I mean, use all the credits, it's massive. This was a large scale, like global collaborative thing that we did. Uh, and just, yeah, oftentimes we're just like, hey, does anyone know where we should go? And sometimes the communities would point us in certain ways. We worked with like Frontline Defenders, the Public Planner Show, and um, London Mining Network, and they moved us up in the communities. And again, we were actively getting that full body, enthusiastic, yes, huge community. We reached out to like 20 or 30 like, different places. And we just wanted people who genuinely wanted to be there. And so that's what we mean by like holding accountability, is actively allowing for the community to make the decision on that point, and to choose to have their face shown, and to choose how they got it shown. And even now, we're still working with all the communities to make sure that we're showing it in a respectful way and everyone gets to see it if they want to. Yeah. I don't know the answer to that. Sorry, that was long-winded. Um, I guess going off that a little bit because it was such a large-scale project. Um, a few questions, I suppose. How did you manage to keep your heart and spirit safe for seven years on the set and in the meetings? And how did you protect yourself, I guess, through that process? when you know that as these industries are funding, you know, the devastation to the land, they're also funding pre predominantly cis white stories to be told through media and the film industry specifically. That was great. Oh my God. Um, yeah, so one spiritual was like, I made out of the back So there's just some stuff that I do every day for myself that's like traditional. Like, okay, so we have this Peugeot, like, uh, the only way to translate it into English that doesn't encompass it at all, but Peugeot, like, it was sort of the beauty, but it also means, like, holiness and, like, sacred and, like, respect, and it's, like, every good word in the English language, like, piled into one word, right? So we have this thing where Peugeot is, so the direct translation is that beauty above me, beauty below me, beauty behind me, beauty around me, and it's that uh, how we walk in the world is just, like, by having that and again beauty is just like where is like the only way to explain in English. Um but so that's what I do every day is like I pray to the creators and all this other stuff. Uh, but also I, I got I got my beads that protect me, I got a little thing stuff that I do. But coming to the financial part, like yeah we had people straight up tell us that what we were doing was impossible all the time. And I didn't we just didn't know that it wasn't that possible, so like we got it made. But there were so many, even now, like this forward to this whole the impact campaign, and even now, people are telling us like you can't do more than five screenings in a month. You can't do, and then we have a screening tomorrow in like Montreal. Like, <laughs> so yes, you can. You can do this stuff. Uh, it would be easier if we was money. So, but uh, it's never like just doing it. It's something that we have. Because I learning film. Right, right, right. The concept is there's no 
spreading water or electricity in this. I know this is all over the place, but it all makes sense at some point, I promise. Um, so they're spreading water or electricity, and so we wanted to start a group that like brought media to the res for us to tell our own story. So um, out of your backpack, that concept was every backpack would have a solar panel, a computer with final cut downloaded onto it, and a camera. Um, so that you could make media out of your backpack and you could go to a three-day workshop where you do production production and post-production in order to tell your own story. So that's how I got it. I don't have any film with like food stamps literally, but I would trade food for people to like act in my films that are or I would steal my from Home Depot, don't steal. Um, <laughs> but that was how we did it. Like that I just you just made this stuff happen. And so that's I think how we also made this film in a lot of ways, which is Knowing that if you really want to do it, it's possible. So we did. And especially, again, so many people gave us the like honor of, of bringing us into their home, of feeding us, of you know, welcoming us, telling their stories. It wouldn't have been right to them to like give up on this project or to not do it justice. And there were definitely times where I think we wanted to quit. Like there were definitely times where I was like, let's just release it. I'm so over it. And you know, other people in my community would say, like, this story deserves deserves to be done well. And so they would like push me to take the time. And I, that's why I say it's a collaborative effort because every single part of it was my community in so many ways. That's what's so important about just that community. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, uh, so uh, what I wanted to do next was to introductions. I know it's a little backwards, but um, please introduce yourselves. Where are the places that you reside and call home? Um, what is your background, research, and your form? Okay, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Catherine. I think I know a good chunk of you in the room. Um, where I call that's a very complicated question, where do I call them? Um, because my ancestors are from the Philippines, but specifically from Surigao Mundo. Um, so Surigao is on the northeastern point of Mindanao, and it's a group of 19 islands, which has shifting boundaries next to the Philippine state. Um, but it's a place where my ancestors were until Canadian mining emerged in the 1960s, predominantly fishermen. Um, so they lived off the land and they had very intricate understandings of what it meant to both sustain water but also be in good relation with water. Um, and so I grew up with a lot of stories that I thought were just folklore <laughs> growing up um, about our encanto or our more than human relatives in this group. So my relatives, for instance, they would talk about how Mono Island, uh, which is about 45 minutes away from Surigao City, for those of you who might know Mindanao geography, um, they would talk about how that island is actually an Encanto that emerged in the shape of the shot. So they say, you know, when we look at Surigao creation stories, um, Surigao began at the bottom of the ocean. And it was these two beating sharks um, whose bodies fell to the bottom of the ocean uh, that turned into rocks and then were transformed into the shape of the shark, which is the shape of the island. So if you look, uh, from the mountain point of Surigao City, you'll actually see like the island looks like the shape of the shop. And there were a lot of these kinds of stories growing up, uh, but I didn't understand as someone who grew up in diaspora. Uh, I used to think, oh, well, <laughs> maybe it's just some kind of folkloric thing that people talk about that doesn't necessarily have any truth to it. Uh, but it was upon doing my dissertation that I started to think more critically about how those stories actually tell us a lot about how our ancestors understood the world and how they navigated our traditions. Um, in my dissertation, sorry to go everywhere, I feel like I'm a little bit chaotic today. Um, my, my dissertation is a love letter to my mother, um, and it's talking about her story of being displaced as a result of Canadian migrants. So. Uh, when she was growing up, they lived in Surigao City and New York Island, and they saw Share International, which is the largest Canadian legal mine in the globe, uh, start to develop not just a mining industry, but a whole extractive industrial complex on that island. So they developed you know, like a resort 
for Canadian miners, and they developed Canadian bakeries and Canadian economies, and they also brought in a labor force from the north um, to really transform uh, that island into an extractive industry, such that people were became heavily reliant on that industry. Uh, so as a result of that industry, fishing started to decline because uh, not only did people become more reliant on mining, so Suriname so were previously fishermen, they became, uh, they worked in various industries, so not just the mining industry itself, they also were, uh, they were given education in geology, they were also working in various kinds of cement industries connected to those mining industrial complexes. Uh, fishing also declined as a result of mining, uh, because the kinds of food production that they saw started to shift. So as the population started to grow, they started to rely more on um, imports rather than on fishing. Um, and for my family, that did, was a world, I describe it as like a world-breaking process. Because you have to think, like these, my, my family is 15 generations of Surigano fishermen who in a span of 15 years have now lost their economic uh, their economic forms of sustainability, as well as the ways that they understood how to make the issue with that land to become part of these various kinds of industries. Um, and as a result of that, what we saw is that in the 1970s, um, industry started to align, actually, that it's built, industry started to align with military. Um, and that was the kinds of circumstances in which my family decided to move abroad. Um, the kinds of feelings of unsafety that mining and militarization together brought in Suriname um, really forced us to think critically about whether we could be safe in the Suriname. Um, and my dissertation is thinking about you know, how do we trace these kinds of histories of infrastructure? How do we trace um, the interlocking relationship between Canadian settler colonialism and what's going on in the Philippine, how the Philippine state actually aligns with Canadian settler governments? As well as thinking about the stories of dinosaurs in the city of So, how do we re narrate uh, our histories, our stories of diaspora, but also our relationship abroad? You know, how do we connect to these lands even as we move away? And uh, it's been a very interesting process doing this research uh, because it's meant you know, talking to elders in my community, talking to my aunties about what was the big old life at that time? Why did we? And then, in addition to that, what was the trauma of moving away to a place like Canada, um, which at the time was predominantly white and sorry, racist as fuck. Um, and so, yeah, it's been an interesting process, I think, thinking through that diasporic experience, but then also finding a lot of hope in the ways that there are actually good connections. So I used to grow up with the you know. We never resisted because we don't, my family did not have stories of the you know, no. um, But then I see the ways in which our language persisted. I see the ways in which those stories persisted. I see the ways in which our food, our, our kinds of, uh, the way that we prepare food, the way the stories that we hear. So, so yeah, navigating all of those kinds of traumas that, uh, yeah, just thinking about what it all means. Um, also, now that we live like, on someone else's land. So, most of my family lives in Toronto. And one of the contradictions for me is that even though we have shared history between Indigenous peoples in so called Canada, we are very implicit in Canadian settlement. There's this kind of desire to feel at home with these desires. <laughs> and desire to claim citizenship. Um, and so I'm, yeah, I'm working through all these kinds of contributions and using my, my family story to make sense of uh, the mess that is colonization. I know it's very complicated. <laughs> just want to let it sit for a second. It's important to hear. Um, my name is Khalifa. Uh, I was more than raised in diaspora as well. Um, so we're all in Colorado, which is on the Turtle Island. And um, my 
ancestors hail from Messiah, um, from the Hobbit, from China, from Greece, England. Um, and the most connection I had to these stories, I can really keep all of us alive and connected between the many time realms. Um, is ones that I had were from my great grandma coming up. Um, and I had a similar connection in terms of hearing stories that I thought were just my crazy grandmother's things to keep me amused and not have to listen to my own story about that. Hearing them integrate and moving back home to all who were also my ancestors. Um, was I started to see the stories unfold that I'd heard from my grandmother and they told they were Greek stories and I just started to see them in different with different faces and different names and um, started to realize that there was something more to surface for me and um, growing up in diaspora though moving to Hawaii and feeling really timid to enter any spaces of indigeneity because I didn't know where I um, and so I studied, I, I studied uh, dance and English, and I stayed strictly in Western ideologies. So Western dance and Western um, queer theory was my focus in English. And it led me to my first uh, research project that I did was for a dance history class, and we had to write our first research paper. Um, and I researched about a twenty is century dancer who contemporary dancer who she was using silks um, and light and I knew that she was one of the only out lesbian dancers at the time. Um, one video at the time of her dancing it was so early and um, people have put color on it and such, but. When I watched that video, I could tell that her queerness was being breathed into the movement. Um, and so I dug around in the libraries at UH and found one of her journals. Um, and she was writing about her lover, who was, of course, her best friend in the journal. And um, she said when she first started, she found these silks in an attic. And, um, the light caught them and she started to move and she was, she was writing that the way that her body felt, the way that she was engaging with movement, felt like the way she does when she was with her lover. And that was what made me kind of understand that the body and that our lived experiences and our identities are so intertwined. Um, and that there's stories there that are told without words and being severed from our language is something that I felt was one of the biggest things that kept me really confident in entering indigenous spaces and feeling like someone, especially as an English major, and I'd like to talk and I feel like confident talking, I couldn't express myself in that language. So finding myself in dance was a way that I could speak about things that I didn't have the words for. Um, and I still was nervous to do that. Um, still stayed in Western structures of performance and movement expression. But then COVID happened and my thesis was supposed to engage different folks who were trans as well um, across Turtle Island and because I was starting to understand that our identities are built up around all these different relationships and communities that we engage and so I wanted to talk to other trans dancers about their experiences being non-binary and how people are non-binary influences their movement how their movement influences their gender identity and then I couldn't travel. So at the time I was living in Waikiki in this really tall apartment building and um, I had to use just myself as my research when I was planning on having all these other moments engaging with work and really wanted to take myself out of it and just observe. Um, but then I was left with just me. And I had I was really lucky to have this big deck outside in Waikiki that I wanted to dance on because it was really the only enough space to do that and um, I started with a prompt um, by what was that? Um, 
It says Colette um, is by a trans non binary author, and they say that um, it exists, basically it sums up to, to to be is to do, and to do is to be, and that's it. Um, and so I was I would just go outside onto this huge patio and wait for the inspiration from that quote to come and then move. And I would do it, I'd set a timer for 30 minutes. I also in the past year recently had to show that I say, hold it. So at the time I was pushing my body and I would like do the 30 minutes and almost pass out or almost or throw up or just going beyond my limit. And I was fighting myself. Um, and then at a certain point I realized that I didn't want to be performing for anyone. And so why was I pushing my body to that that breaking point, you know? Um, for this expression, like just to exist is not the quote that I started with. So I didn't have to do all these things that made me feel weird, you know, to like feel like I was dancing, you know, or doing what I said I would do. And um, there was this moment where I was dancing and it started to rain. Um, and I always wore socks because it was summer, and wet socks is the <laughs> um, and so there was a moment where I was like, oh, I'm done. I'm going back inside. I only like, danced for like five minutes raining that day. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This is the environment that I'm in. I'm surrounded in this cement jungle of you know, building. And so many people could be watching me right now because there's hundreds of windows. And I can't see any of them watching me. So there's a weird understanding of perception that's actually really fascinating as a trans person. And all these people are looking at me, and that scares me. And now it's raining, and it's going to go inside. And then I saw through the building's model of rally and realized I was not dancing for the people who could be watching that didn't know. I was not dancing even for my own thesis or myself anymore. I was dancing because it was raining. I was dancing because I could still see the valley through the building. I was dancing because the most precious thing that we still have as indigenous people is our bodies and it's the land. And it's the same. So, that's my research. After graduating, I moved into understanding my indigeneity. I realized that I'm Mahu, and since then, um, have just been doing a lot of community work to help other people come into their bodies that I feel so lucky to have done during that time, and continue to step into engage in all these forms um, of being and of uh, uh, being a community member, which as a mom person is the thing that I feel defines me more than me calling myself that. Um, so long with the way to say who I am. But um, that's the work that I do and I am just so grateful to see films being made like your film. Um, because so many times over in the film there were different ways that that was said that we're still here, and we're still indigenous because like, and we still can talk to each other and have these kinds of conversations. And, um, I see that as dance too. That like these conversations when I dance about the about Mama Valley and how it saw me in that moment, I don't see myself. Someone doesn't know that's what I'm dancing about, but they might feel the mountain. They might feel the recognition of self that broke open out of me in that moment. My body and that energy might bring you home to a place where you can dream about people now. So you grow waters and you learn rain. And so, yes, well, I'll again just to say thank you for showing us that we're not alone in that. All of us. Um, yeah. That was beautiful, by the way. I'm going to listen to the two of you talk all of us. <laughs> This is an amazing story. I'm like, oh my god, I'm so just like honored to be in the And what well, you said, that's exactly why we need to know. It's to remind other people that like, you're not alone. Mm-hmm. It feels isolating sometimes. I'm like, y'all are a little odd. And so it feels isolating, but like, you know, we're all here. And resistance is so many different forms. It's like, it's dance, it's looking into family, it's cooking, it's food. Um, Sometimes it's frontline work, sometimes it's political work, sometimes it's education work, but it's all the work together that we see 
you know, huge steps being made, and like huge steps forward happening. Um, so yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, there was that moment that I was just so compelled by when he went to visit a dolphin in the WNBA and the dancing with the black uh, and you know, sometimes resistance is seen as a binary, as the arms, because this is where you're at. You have to do this. And then also there's the resistance of the physical body is on the line to guard the line. And sometimes we come into contrast with families who have joined the state. Have participate, and I feel like that is the kind of we know that it in our lives too. The pain sometimes of knowing that um, we have people who have collaborated or are in this like dance of trying to hold tension. Um, and so I'm just curious about your, your journey in that because you know, for, for me and my own lived experience, we went back to um, our, our people are from Portia, which is in the north. So very similar resistance, along with genealogies and resistance. And my child is there now in the market. So it's an intergenerational commitment. I'm scared every day for them. Um, but what I'm really just excited about, right, and, and, and always encouraging my friends, I still manage to do it. But it's that binary thing that gets me you know, also Arms like willing to take up arms and they're willing to take up the line. It feels so stark. And it's maybe all these things are the same, right? The dance and the adaptation and the care and the problem of this work is. But it's still this binary that that has to be it's hard to come on. So I'm just curious about what it was like to be um have you been able to observing those communities the struggle. So like yeah, my my mom like freaked out 
one of the first, she saw some footage of like someone pointing a gun straight at us, and she was like, uh oh, you can't go on set anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I know how hard that is because I've done that with them on my other so I can easily break it. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, one of the things I really love about how you, um, in addition to showing different kinds of resistance, there were different scales, you know, there were really small groups, and then there's standing rock, which, you know, is kind of like mass mobilization. And I really appreciated how there wasn't a value being more a really more mass movement, but these small mobilized things are really significant to them, too. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the decisions for which Sometimes I've been on board this thing for over a year. Sometimes someone asks me a question, and I'm like, huh, I didn't even realize that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I guess we did focus on different sides. It's also, I think that's what I mean by like every form of resistance is so important. you know, so I live in a cold area in Flagstaff, Arizona. It's like half the time it's really hot, half the time. We literally had like record breaking snow this year, it was something like, like 16 feet of snow, fell over like five months, like insane amounts of snow. Um, but so that meant that like people were freezing to death pretty regularly. So I started telling people, and this is something that I do in my daily life, is like I carry around my hand and feet warmers, like little ones that you can pack up, and clean, dry pairs of socks. Because I can save like someone's life. And it's such a simple thing to do. But that's that's a way of resistance. You're not all bowing for, you know, capitalism or like another body. Um, and so I think all of it is super important. And that's just what resistance is babysitting for somebody who's like a single mother, that's resistance. Cooking food and opening your house to like have people in and eat, that's your resistance. And then, yeah, step all the way up to the big scale, like standing up is resistance. And in a lot of ways, standing up is so crucial because so many people, like to my face, my entire life, people have been telling me, like, you can't be native. You guys don't exist anymore. Like, all the time. I don't have a girl in Scotland. We were sitting on a lake. And this little light came over. And see these babies which you from this lake. It seems like human my body. And it's coming across the lake. And I'm like, oh my God, this is a fairy. Shit, I'm seeing a fairy. And she's like, oh yeah, I see them all the time. Yeah, there's a fairy, there's a fairy in here. Hot comes and there's fairy. So I saw my first fairy. I also saw it. But a few minutes later, she was like, I have the dreaded round question. She's like, what are you? And I was like, oh, Jeanette, now I love Native American. She's like, no, 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 no. We're all dead. What are you? So I learned two things. One, I am not a school, not a fairy. And Two, people don't know that exist. So, <laughs> but standing up kind of like reminded the whole world that we exist and that we're still here. So that's what's super crucial about standing up. Even though, like, technically, yes, they lost. And technically, yes, the pipeline got put in. And then technically, yes, it immediately burst. But in so many ways, we built community and we built connection, and that was so vital. So, in a lot of ways, the state of is still happening, it's still going on. And us talking about it and us knowing each other and, and seeing the movement that happened afterwards. Um, but also the small resistance, they've been happening for so long. Like we've been like in 2020 with everything that happened with their garden. So it was like huge BLM movement happened, right? And that really pushed forward for a lot of ways, especially in media, the conversation about diversity. And now we're seeing native films and media and television, and we're seeing you know black voices being featured, not just in the movement. February, and they were seeing like Asian Pacific Islander, like not just being featured, it was in March, May, <laughs> I should know, but it's definitely like, you know, we're seeing these things out, and also, we think the fact that uh, they're going to do one this month or whatever is November, come on, come on, guys, Thanksgiving, that was a great way, I think, for the water can and a bunch of people actually is saying about it. Yeah, well, Thanksgiving was I had like freezing temperatures, and they were just like blasting people with water. And I was like, wow, that's like, this is so unironic. Like, it's crazy. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, so we saw this huge movement going on. We see the person, we see people have these conversations, and we see this. And that's all, like, all of that stuff is so crucial and important. But also, 
also the diversity work had been going on for ages before that you can see people really pushing. So all the groundwork was laid and it was taking and push it forward over the edge to where we have more diversity in these things. And that's I think what Standing Rock also is because we need those small movements, we need the intimate people, we need groups like Lang, we need like all of these things doing community work, we need nonprofits that like, organize things together and doing smaller things. And just like Anthony was telling me earlier about, you know, we're all looking at an elephant, but we're all looking at different parts of the elephant with this tail, this like ears. We have to zoom out numbers of elephants together, but we need all of those parts together. Um, yeah, so I think that's, that's what's so crucial about that. <laughs> so I wanted to talk to um, you all to speak on the connections and defenses um, from the film. So after watching the film, can we all please talk a little bit about the connections? And intersections between and among the various places and issues, issues highlighted in the film and in differences. Can you talk a little bit about the differences, differences such as place-based specificities between these different places, um, place-based contacts? Because I know, like, for example, like now, it's a diverse community um, area, right? Um, Catherine, you can talk a little bit about Suriga, but then um, the Bato is a different context, too, so where it works. Um, and the complexity of Mindanao, and in Hawaii here, where we are showing this film and internal island. So that, that's a multiple question. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so I saw a lot of connections when I was going to such a level, and I actually played that part of the film. Oh, well, first of all, Oh, I didn't know that people from the club. Like that, like that. Um, but then when we were watching the film together, they were, I think, major differences in terms of our history of activism. So I'll just kind of back up a little bit to provide a little bit more context about Mindanao. So Mindanao is the southern part of the Philippines, a large island, island per se. Um, and Mindanao has a very unique history in life. So, during American occupation, um, Mindanao had different kinds of policies of settlement, uh, particular, particularly colonial. And Americans thought that initially that they would actually expand the project of settler colonies in the Channel Island to Mindanao. So, they thought they were going to stay in Mindanao. And in Cotabato, they actually had settlement projects where they would uh, encourage Filipinos from the north to claim so-called empty lands in the south um, through homestay. And that history also followed in Surigao, uh, but there were different systems in, amongst like, the different kinds of uh, tribes within Surigao. So for instance, in Surigao, um, we were seen as settled, settled lands. So uh, settled lands meant that we were already in closer proximity to civilization that still needed to be settled Versus in Cotabato, they were seen as the frontier lands. Um, and I bring up those kinds of distinctions, and particularly that history of settler colonialism, um, because it's important for us to think about this is where the conflict happens. So, yes, we have histories of colonialism in the Philippines, but we have a lot of conflict amongst the Philippines. And when I was looking at the film, I was thinking, my mom and I were thinking, oh, you know, it's interesting. The Philippine state is also part of that, that issue. The Filipinos are part of that question. Um, and it's a really difficult conversation to have uh, the kinds of anti indigeneity that Filipinos have internalized as a result of those kinds of racial hierarchies, which were exactly that to talk about the US interested in um, So those are kind of some of the things that came to mind for me. And then thinking specifically about Sudigal, it was really fascinating to hear about the whole lot of experiences. And I was so moved to hear the front line you know, to see those women on the front line, to have that kind of refusal, not just to mind, but also towards the state. Um, and that is not actually a history that we see in Sudigal, despite the fact that Sudigal is actually the second largest mining site in the Philippines. Um, so thus far, you know, a lot of my conversations and in my research, I haven't found 
those kinds of direct refusals. Um, and I had to really sit with my ancestors because I was very frustrated. Like, why are we not resisting the violence? And why aren't we just telling them to get the F off our back? And I had to understand, you know, for people in Surigao, it's a very complicated situation. Right? So some Surigao are working with the mines. And also when mining begins, this is the aftermath of Japanese occupation. So people wanting to have some kind of hero to help us. To help us recover our country, help us recover our land, help us recover our countries. Um, and so, yeah, I, 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 found, I found myself wanting to see more of myself in the bottle, but also realizing there are actually significant differences um, because of the histories of how our people have and have, have not been you know, the kind of resistance. I think, in terms of the of Hawaii, there's also similar. Uh, conflict between different groups of Hawaiians and it's when you've been so raised by the like bigger systems, um they don't and you don't see we're not seen we sometimes don't see each other. And um yeah I think that's it can be really difficult and it goes back to like it's not black and white the way that we all exist. Um, but that we have to remember that it's the same element, right? And um, I think there's been a lot of kinship globally around these circumstances, like the film shows. Um, but we had when we were Catherine and I met on Monica, and then while we were up there, we were being informed and led by standing rock folks who knew what to do when the tractors are coming up and you chain yourself to the cattle ground, like. I only did it, everyone. So it's, um, yeah, I think it's also just this reminder that when we come down off the mountain and when, you know, the, the black snake goes into the earth and the, you know, the oil is in our drinking water and um, we're all fighting, um, that, yeah, we have to remain. Conscious that we have and hold our own perspectives and are each very precious. Um, and then when we offer those perspectives, even if there are things that need to be broken away or indigenized about them, that we hold each other through those um, moments of coming back and returning to ourselves. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I don't know, it's kind of my own focus, but seeing Grace the, the Video in the part with the, um, the dancing and the gun. I think that that scene specifically does capture this kind of like complexity that there is that we hold with all kinds of ways that we approach resistance and um, how we share so many of the same experiences that approach us so differently, but that we got the same element that we still wake up and show up for the ancestors, for the land, and for ourselves and for each other. Um, and trying to do better the next day again, you know. So, um, you know, very vague answer to the question, but I think there's just yeah, so many complexities that we have to constantly be alert and aware of. Yeah. I just back yeah, off what you just said because I do want to talk about Mona Care. Yeah. Some people that I met really weird time where there happened to be actually a lot of Filipino activists on. So the, the moment that sticks out for me, in addition to all the weird, interesting conversations we had about being queer as far as what it meant for us to stand for our ancestors on that moment, was when there was another moment that there would be hope. There was this youth from White Mom. And this 15-year-old kid said something so beautiful that it still sticks with me to this day. He said, you know. Our ancestors have not always stood for our lives. We have not always stood for our fathers. We came to Montreal to learn what it means to stand in this world. So that we can stand with our ancestors did this And I felt like, well, that's like really, there's something different that happened in that moment. And I saw that also in the ways in which we 
lack of these forms of resistance in your I was so grateful to have met you all the all the time, to have shared that experience with all those other Filipinx folks that we've met and reaching these conversations as well. Um, how we can be in this place to be. Um, it wasn't just that on Cam was transforming our relationship, but also Filipinx folks. We were also teaching other folks about what it means for us to be living one of the times of struggle we're trying to build in our future. Yeah, it's really beautiful. So I, I've been hearing a lot of like no more allies we can accomplish that. And <laughs> I feel like that's kind of how it feels when people came up to the mama to hold space like that. It wasn't just that we stand with you metaphorically, like our bodies are here. Right next to yours, and that is an accomplice. That's not just an ally. Then, um, yeah, I, when I was on on a kid too, I didn't really. That. Growing up in Colorado, I am liked brown and was mistaken for Mexican most of the time, and then really didn't know where my melanin came from. I did not understand what it meant in any way to be Filipino, other than that that's one of the things that I am. And it was a word that had no context for you because my family was so separated. And um, when I was on on a camera, there were all these Filipinos, and they were like, "You're one of us." And I was like, "Yeah." <laughs> and so the, that, like, that a place that is also part of my indigenous as a Hawaiian was bringing me back to the Philippines too. And then when we watch these films about people that are on the other side of the globe caring for the same earth, we we return to ourselves over and over again to watch that. In their, with their hands and their feet. And there's another quote too, which uh, one of the Hatchies from Sandy Rock at the very end of the film said, um, we, the roots are dried from the bottoms of our feet already, like the from of our feet. And that's what it felt like being on Mauna Kea was that like, all of the roots were exposed all of a sudden. Like, I'm Chinese, I'm Filipino, I'm Mama, all, I'm, I'm Greek, all of these things. I can see the roots for the first time. And I mean, like, when you hear, Kids and youth that get to experience that, and you know, kids have, kind of, I think, more contact to the other, like these other realms, and so they can feel how how palpable and incredible it was that all of us were gathered in that place. And I think some of our ancestors did stand, and some of them didn't. But regardless, we stand today, and um, maybe we sit together too. <laughs> like, it's it's um yeah. It's great. Uh, uh, actually, it was flying first and then started climbing places that here to reach. Um, actually, before that, I was living on the main spot in Shibra. Um, and like, we're going to have like a business mentor there and um, do all that stuff all the time. Like, uh, I got to move closer to my grandparents and be like, <laughs> learn this language and all that. But um, I'm also a therapist. So, I would really love to like start some kind of like indigenous support group or like decolonial support group or like have a space where you can like sit and process like all this stuff and like hear all this like tension and hardness and like. It's like making all these noises in the back, all pissed off. Like, like you can't drink fuel in the water. And I'm like, fucking okay, yes, because that's happening to people. I heard this like wait that the playground I'm talking about. They were poisoned by a red hill. And you know, they have two years to file something to say something about it. Anyway, so you can be like right outside, like you know, look at the valley, look at the trees, and like just like connect to the land for a second, ground and what comes up because I think that would be different for everyone. Um, but I think that might take me the time to just like slow down and like all your self be like, what just happened? Um, but yeah, that was a really awesome movie. Like, ahead. It's so good. Oh, yeah, no, 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 no
like what you said too about like um, the communities will tell you what sustainability looks like for each place, right? Which is really just like the land of each place has a different way of being. Um, and I guess the other thing I want to say to contemporary art, you know, just for like talking about how like our ancestors did for this, or how do we use this place now, right? For them, um, but there was something somebody said in the documentary too that was like, um, yeah, our ancestors did or give up a lot of things, but they also had a lot of different things too. So, blah, blah, blah. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate all the different ways people heard this that I showed up. But yeah, so you can go outside and like um, just walk the tree or the grass or something. That would be really helpful. Find your back to the land. Yeah, that's awesome. And like, as that, like, such a good nature, and nature also is like, our bodies are nature too, and it needs to remind yourself to get back to that too, and give like time and space for the integration. Because it's a lot more than that. That's so funny. Where were we talking about? No, no, no. I was talking about getting just like further, like, up the track to get over the round of the and also to the part of the house. And then, like, there was some light benches around it. And there was some sand around it. It looks like the trees had a wave. Like food is, is life, food and 
you know, in the Philippines, you have people like showing up their impressive kitchens and their cool food with their hands. That's what I'm saying. Like, this is the young person. I'm trying to be proud of the food that I get to make. I'm proud of the experience that I have. I love to see people. Um, and actually, we don't ever put me on the red line. It's my favorite person I went to. I go home and I thought, like, oh, I buy out like seven different meals for like seven days. It's just how it's cut. I'm going to go with my food. And I'm like, there's to yourself also is your experience. Because people around you can tell you about your experience, they can tell you about your problems, but you're the only person who can tell you about it. So how do you see this? Our partners and collaborators have been donating to the Boyle organization, of course, not to be very helpful. Yeah. The board member, sorry, I wanted to acknowledge it. Kat, Jimmy, Yvette, Rebecca, um, David, Kelly, uh, as well, and the panel, like, you know, for coming down, Catherine, um, could be home for it, right? Um, you're coming to be home for it. Uh, yeah, maybe right like here, um, in the back, for the photo. Yeah, and then we have to four, so we wanted to make space for you guys to go outside and connect the NP community, eat some food, tell a story. Here, you know. <laughs>